uh, here, very delighted to have on campus uh, someone who's become a familiar face to you over the next few years, I'm quite sure, uh, Ken McMullen. Uh, Ken is professor of fil and a anniversary professor of film uh, at uh, Kingston University in London. And Ken and I have worked on many projects in the past, including uh, the film Oki, uh, An Act of Resistance, uh, which we screened at the Moscow International Film Festival and the London International Film Festival and won the British University Film and Video Council Award uh, for Best Film uh, that year. But Ken's career as a filmmaker uh, stretches way back before that and he's worked uh, with some, uh, speak now, uh, he's, he's worked uh, with uh, some amazing actors, actresses and directors uh, in his time and he has uh, been the British uh, choice at the Cannes Film Festival, he has won the San Sebastian uh, Film Festival, he's been at the Berlin Film Festival, um, his work includes films with uh, the philosopher Jacques Derrida, he's worked with Ian McKellen, he's worked uh, with uh, the French actor Dominique Pino uh, as, as well, he's worked with uh, artists like Cantor, uh, Tadeusz Cantor, and has worked extensively with the late John Berger. Uh, many of you will know John Berger's work, uh, most notably, I think, one of the his ways of seeing, but John has uh, had a huge uh, back catalogue. And the work that we're going to look at um, today is a piece of film that Ken made uh, with John Berger at CERN at the uh, nuclear facility uh, in Geneva. And at the moment, in fact, uh, in Liverpool, there's an exhibition, Broken Symmetries, in which artists respond to the work of CERN. Uh, and our original plan, before things went awry, was w this is coinciding uh, with, um, with that exhibition as well. This is kind of the original version of this. This is when CERN first opened, when Ken and John Berger uh, went, and did, went and did that work. So. Ken will now say a few things about that, say a few things about that, because we've gone all night talking about this. Then we'll show, then we'll show the film and then we'll have uh, some discussion afterwards. Mm. Thank, thank you, Martin, yeah. Um, I'll stand up. Um, first of all, thank you for coming. It's great. Uh, it's an amazing place. I, uh, I didn't know this campus. It's really interesting to, to see it. And thank you to Martin for arranging this and so on. So, uh, in brief, John Berger, uh, I, I had met him when I was a student. He I was at the Slade, and he came and talked at the Slade and things like that, and I'd met him then. This is long, long ago. And then we did a series of films together. We did one, uh, basically we did, a, the most important one of them was a film on Rembrandt. And uh, John, uh, a Spanish artist called Grillo, you may know him in fact, and, uh, and myself each did a section of this film on Rembrandt. And so we knew each other quite well in that. And then uh, we did a lot of platforms in Paris at the Pompidou and so on together about aspects of cinema and uh, literature. Anyway, I was working in CERN on a research project and I had the idea that maybe John would come to CERN and I could possibly film an encounter between John Berger and a couple of young but extremely brilliant um, physicists, quantum, quantum mechanics being their primaries, uh, primary areas of work, because CERN was a, the investment in CERN at that time, it's higher now, but at that time was one billion euros a year for the search for the Higgs boson, this extraordinary, the, f the, 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 the magical particle, if you like, let's call it. You can ask me questions about this later, if you like. But anyway, that, that I was there doing a kind of correspondence to that in film and art practice. And then I asked John to come in, and he said, well, I, and actually John is a significant intellectual, and he certainly understood quite a lot about quantum me mechanics, but he was obviously nervous to suddenly go in and confront uh, some of the particularly brilliant characters, two of whom you'll see. Um, and he said, well, I'll, I, I will only go in if I go in armed. 
These are his words. And I want to go armed with poetry. And so I thought that was quite a rather interesting. So he said that he would present to the two young physicists, in this case, uh, poetry, one by Borges, wi which we'll concentrate on uh, primarily. And, um, and, and he wanted to hear what their responses were to this, as was his response to their work in, uh, in particle physics. And so that's effectively how it happened. Uh, I took him in. John used to, he was eight, you know, he was about 75 or something at the time. Maybe, seven, maybe, maybe early 70s. And he was still driving um, or riding a, a thousand Norton motorbike. Maybe you know this. He used to live in, Sw in uh, France and drive over, to, um, drive over to Switzerland on this thousand Norton motorbike. Um, and so he came in, and uh, over a number of days, we, 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 we shot this, this very, very simple film. There's no money to do this. This is just me making a diary of, of him there and the encounter. And, um, uh, but also, the great pleasure for me was that I was building some artworks there. And so as I built these artworks, which uh, be were exhibited extensively afterwards, some of them quite large, uh, I was in correspondence and discussion with John Berger while they were being done. On this DVD, actually, there's one section which is all about the unveiling of one of the works with John Berger there. So that's a sort of, so it was an intent, you know, exchange. Uh, beyond that, uh, I think we, we can let it go. I'll just, to identify the two physicists involved, I'll just say this. One of them is a theorist and the other is an experimentalist. <coughs> And in physics, that means that one of them is developing things highly abstractly, and the other one has to try and prove it using all the technologies that are available. So it's uh, one of them, uh, Michael Dozer, whose name is an experimentalist, is probably going to get the Nobel Prize. Because young, very young. But he is the first person to harness uh, antimatter, to actually catch it, antimatter. Antihydrogen is what he actually calls it. And you'll see a tiny bit of that within the film. But the discussion is about the nature of science and the nature of literature. That's it. So we'll have a look. It's, I think it's about 40 minutes long. It's not excessive. So there we go. Yeah. Good. Play the movie. Yeah, we'll play it. Yeah, and I'll go and sit and watch it too. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I'd never seen that before. You've never seen that before, no. Well, it had, it had, a, bit, it has had a fair amount of distribution in a way. Um, the y wh when I w no, it's a diary, of course. It's a diary of an encounter, really, uh, o over a few days uh, when John came into CERN. Um, at the time, the background to that is that I was the director of a, of a project called Signatures of the Invisible. And I effectively um, put together uh, with the help of Michael Benson, who was the managing this, uh, put together a group of international artists who were acceptable to the to CERN, of course, um, and had some knowledge of quantum mechanics or, or at least of physics on a certain level. And um, we did a collaboration in CERN. It wasn't the idea wasn't to illustrate um, the theoretical physics, but was to correspond to it or respond to it with um, with visual artworks. Well, not just visual artworks, they could well have been dance and motion and so on, as in fact you saw with the uh, light bulb. Um, and then that, uh, it took off that, uh, that pro uh, project, and, um, uh, and it was pretty reasonably financed, because obviously it cost quite a bit to put that together. Uh, and then it uh, went on uh, major exhibitions throughout the world. I mean, we were very fortunate. The the th I think a lot of this is shot in the Gulbenkian in Lisbon. Some of it in PS1 in New York, which was new, uh, MoMA at the time, took that exhibition, and then they, they, uh, they their galleries were closed, and so it went over to PS1 during that short period of time when they were refurbishing. And uh, the Atlantis Gallery in London, I think, is in that. But basically, the artists responded to continual discussions of the type we've just seen. So that just, so I was there for months, I was there actually for a number of years, in and out all the time. And what I was doing was meeting different physicists, 
uh, I was very fortunate to work with closely with uh, the great uh, Maurice Jacob, who was a head of theory at CERN and was also um, head of the French Physics Society and was uh, re regarded very highly in the UK and so on and so on. Um, and I spent many, many hours talking about this kind of issue, about how does time flow, for example. It's a sort of fascinating when you get down to things. Um, and so, uh, so that was an example of the kind of discussions and how we'd set them up and we'd just be talking and so on. And then we would be able to move into the some of the technological areas. Uh, I had access to the prototype uh, labs, engineering labs there. So uh, those works, a couple of works of mine, uh, were engineered at CERN. They were, they were made with tremendous precision, actually, at CERN, based on theories, various theories. Kind of uh, based on theories or responding to theories. So that's how that came about. And, uh, and then, it because there was a diary, uh, of the actual DVD has hours on it. It's got about three hours on it in different kinds of areas, elements. Um, but in many cases, uh, in galleries, as it was shown, this would be shown, of course. Uh, and then it went to the National Library for National Film Theatre, all these kind of places, ICA, all these kind of things it was shown in the United States and various places. So it, it was a, quite a, an explosion from a very small uh, beginning. So I'm trying to understand, trying to think about what that actually was, in that is it a film? Yeah. Is it a painting? <laughs> there is Ken is a trained painter, trained in mm. Liverpool, mm. Uh, and trained at the Slade uh, mm. as a fine artist and as a pa painter and has a practice as a, as a painter. There's always something mm. painterly about your cinema, mm. whether it is, for example, the clouds, that that cloud mm. that cloud scene, whether it is the Mm. The, the child jumping into the pool, or whether it's even the setup of the four of you around that mm. round, 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 round that table. There's, al there's always always something pa mm. painterly, mm. but there's also uh, there's also a series of ideas mm. running running through. It's also an essay mm. on uh, art, 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 and art and science. Mm. Mm. And on the one hand, that's kind of uh, the sort of work that you've done before, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm wondering whether there's something specific about responding to the enormity of CERN and what mm. CERN mm. means in, in mm. choosing the choosing the way you respond to it. Mm. I mean, part of the choice was out of necessity, or if you like. Um, the um, by the way, the reason I'm in it, which is which I'm always slightly squirm at when I see myself there, but um, it was this, that I it was very difficult to get people to talk if I wasn't present within it. It was just one of those things. Uh, I knew the physicists well, I knew John well, reasonably well, and so I was able to sort of uh, kind of bring this together, sort of glue it together in a way, and the fact I was there, uh, when I went out, because I a number of occasions I tried to film, and I was out, and uh, I think the scientists found themselves quite inhibited with John. I mean, he's quite a powerful figure, to say the least. And um, and then they would respond and so on. But that's why I was in it. it that's shot over a few days. Really, you talk about over a few hours, over a few days. Um, but my intention was, uh, the intention is, of course, different to the result, but the intention was, I think I'd better copy some some of this down. I better get a diary note of this, uh, you know, a uh, recording of this, because it's it, it may be of great value to people to uh, to see this kind of exchange and the kind of level we went to. Uh, then the artworks, of course, came into it, and um, we end up with this mon kind of montage, really, of uh, of different, and they're very different. I mean, the uh, the art the artworks are completely different, and they each artist responded in a very, very different way. Some didn't spend very much time there. Uh, others, like Bartholomew de Santos, spent months there, mesmerized by what he was able to 
question and what he was able to find out. You know, very simple things like what is color? Well, that sounds, sounds banal, but what is color? Uh, to the physicists, color was a temperature. It wasn't a, a visual thing, it was a temperature. And so in physics, the, uh, the color range is far greater than it is to the human eye. Uh, going off into the ultraviolets and the infrareds and so on and so on. Uh, and, and so they were talking about color in very different ways. What is an edge? What is surface? If you're trying to work on something, what is the surface? The surface, you know, one definition I was told one day, the surface is only the uppermost level of the mass. It's the, up the mol molecular uppermost area of the mass. That's what a surface is. So you don't really, if you're painting, you don't really need the mass, the, the, the thing there. You only need the, <laughs> you only need <laughs> one atom thick uh, layer. And there was attempts to try and do that, actually, which is kind of fascinating. Mm -hmm. Anyway, many, many things. So also, it was, an ex it was a, a journey. I mean, for me, it was a journey. Of course, I had no idea where each one of these was going to go, any w each of these discussions was going to go. Um, so that's, so I don't know if it's a film. Well, it's a film insofar as we can project it. Uh, and it's a film insofar as it's got a time element from beginning to end. There is a kind of beginning to end, and it's got chapters. Um, is it drama? Are people, are people actually acting out roles within this? Something I kept consider all the time, and I was fascinated in that. Uh, once the roles were established, did they, each of the characters, including myself, did we act out these roles then? The, the roles were, could have been predictable, but without us necessarily knowing it. If that makes sense, uh, you know. Once you say you are the theorist, well, the theorist becomes the theorist. <laughs> you are the intellectual who's coming here to question. He's he John does that. In other moments, by the way, he wasn't like that. He was playing with material actually and things like that. Uh, you know, this was shot also as I'd have on a tiny camera, really, a tiny Sony camera. And I asked Justinian, who's edited many of my pictures and much big films. Uh, I said, look, uh, just keep on John for as long as you can. Uh, even if he's silent, I, I want to see, or I think we should be able to see thought in progress. That is, watch somebody thinking instead of cut, 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 cut. Just leave it on people. On. Let him, let's see what the thinking process is, or, or at least what the, what the timing is of thought finding articulation. Um... And that was it. I mean, of course, I, c I, I didn't direct it from outside. I was sat in it, so it was a bit more. So uh, he needs a critic to tell us whether it's a film or not a film. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very unfair oh. question to ask, ask, ask the No, answer. it's a fascinating <laughs> question, really. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. T tell, so t t tell, tell us a little bit more about your work with John Berger. The, does, does that film, there is, does the Rembrandt work? that you've done? Well, well the Rembrandt, yeah, that I mean, I knew John, I met John at the Slade, originally, uh, when he came in and was, th in those days, the great, you know, new Marxist critic, when he came in and gave talks, uh, uh, in 1970. Uh, I'm extremely articulate, of course, and fascinating. And I, I m read uh, his book, um, A Painter of Our Time, which I, I was very moved by, and a number of other works after that. So I discussed that kind of thing with him. Then I made a film called Ghost Dance, which Martin knows very well. And this was shown at the Pompidou. And the Pompidou asked uh, if I would do a platform on the relationship between literature and film. And I, I didn't know really what I could say about that, but I could certainly talk about the film and how it came about. And the person who was on the platform with me was John Berger. And so that was excellent because, you know, he would take over that s side of it and come up with good questions and so on. And so we worked together there. Uh, then I discussed a couple of his plays and I was 
interested in, uh, I'm just going to land to some extent, in possibly working on a film around the, 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 the drama sides. But that got l moved on to uh, arriving at this commission from the BBC. And the commission was, it was an anniversary of some sort, now would, would we do, now individually I'm talking about, a film about Rembrandt. Uh, would I do 20 minutes? Would John do 20 minutes? Would Grillo, the Spanish artist, do 20 minutes? Would they? Uh, would we each do 20 minutes and then combine them into one piece? Um, well, we did that. Uh, John's work, I thought, was terrific. He he worked primarily on a Rembrandt portrait. I think it's the one in Kenwood House, where he is. He says that Rembrandt is really looking at him not him looking at the Rembrandt portrait and it's a fascinating sort of discussion about it. Um, I did one where about disattribution. That is that, um, you know, uh, 50 years ago there were supposed to be 400 Rembrandts approximately. Uh, now we know there are only 200, maybe even less than 200 because there were so many very close ones. They were being called Rembrandts and sold at high prices. And so disinterpretation became a very big thing. And I did, I did a film, a drama, uh, a sort of semi-comic, surreal drama around this issue of disinterpretation. Um, and Griel did a uh, very interesting animation piece. So there were three curious films. The BBC hated them, I think. <laughs> and uh, the <laughs> One of the commissioning editors uh, had, he thought he'd never seen anything like it or as bad. I think one of them fainted. In the uh, when he saw it, actually, in the viewing theatre. <laughs> However, it went out, and it was extremely successful. <laughs> we had loads of responses. Um, so it was quite a fresh piece of work. And John was very proud of that and very pleased with that. And, of course, we got on well. So calling him up to come to CERN, I mean, I knew where he lived. I'd never been there, but I knew where he lived. And I knew it was in range CERN. And I was then based in CERN quite a lot. So uh, I think the, the chronology was something like I called him up, went out to see him uh, on the farm where he was living, and then uh, he agreed to come and come into CERN. And both of us were interested in this. I mean, uh, it is an extraordinary thing. I mean, universities cost a lot of money, but CERN, my God, it costs a fortune. And yet uh, the material that comes out of it is absolutely staggering. Where by the way, the physics that's described in this film is, in my understanding, to some extent already outdated. Um, that is that um, the concept that the universe will continue to expand to a point where mass defeats gravity, uh, that was consistent up to probably around 2000 or just after 2000. And then a number of discoveries, profound discoveries were made about which things you'll have heard of, which is dark matter and dark energy. You've heard these terms. And uh, that was to do with technological advances, to do with the way telescopes could peer deep, deep, deep to the almost the edge of the universe. That is, they could see events that had taken place four billion years ago, because that's the time it would probably take for the light and the ra radio activity and so on to arrive at the telescope sensors and that's what you're seeing you're looking back in time and uh, in the basis of that it, it changed the nature of how they perceived it so th the idea that maybe time will revert and go the other way well it's the jury's out but um, uh, th there are very many different things being discovered in the last 10 years since that point uh, it's almost as if we've we're on the point uh, in our understanding of things uh, as the first discovery is that the Earth was round. You know, prior, prior to that, it was flat, now it's round. And then um, we thought that matter, uh, we could understand what matter is, we know what a chair is, what a glass is, we know all the, what these things are because we use them. But when you come to the conclusion or you thought that this is only 4%, of everything that exists. That is everything we know, including the air, the molecules, everything, everything. Everything we know is only 4% of what com 
you know, makes up the universe. This is staggering stuff. And you have to really think about a lot of things. Well, is it worth thinking about it? Uh, you're alive. You're alive now. This is our time. Uh, it's contemplation on these things is, is, I think, extraordinarily fruitful uh, and nourishing. So th this is f perhaps how, and this is how I, John and I would talk about that. That we don't have an objective. There's no objective. We couldn't say, yes, we're going to prove that this is this. What we wanted to do was really go on a journey and think about it. I wish they'd uh, understood that the idea that time would run backwards was outdated before Martin Amos wrote uh, Time's Arrow. That would have saved us all, <laughs> saved us all a lot of pain <coughs> having to read that terrible book. Um, I'll ask you uh, one more question and we'll all open mm. it out, which is, uh, so has CERN, the enormity of CERN, the challenge of CERN, has that, how has that changed your practice and your work as a filmmaker? Well, it certainly changed it as uh, an artist making things. Uh, which I continue to do, and I tend to draw on those discussions and others, perhaps in psychoanalysis as well, and so on, in the in the working through of artworks that I'm wor work making, working through. Um, and sometimes I don't think it's necessarily understood what the cause and effect uh, ratio is between something as conceptually powerful as going into CERN and then working on a narrative, maybe. But it may have affected me insofar as I don't, this is very contentious, uh, I don't really believe in scripts. I, I believe in intention and then I believe that in the process of working with that intention uh, we depart into something else and, the s and a script emerges. This is actually quite complex, but I have probably, I think that may have been affected by the CERN experience. Because certainly working with, I mean, it's a wonderful thing, working on things like the Crumple theory. Anybody heard of the Crumple theory? Here? <laughs> the Crumple theory. The Crumple theory, it's, it go, I'm gonna, the brief is this. Take a piece of paper, all right? And I take two pieces of paper from the same book. Now, uh, we have to assume in my description, that the paper, uh, uh, of this paper A and paper B are atomically the same structure, because of the same piece of paper. Then crunch it in your hand, and then go to the next one and crunch that in your hand with the same force. And then you open it out, and um, uh, for some reason, inexplicable, the, uh, the crumples are completely different. Or, or there's a variation within the crumple. Now, of course, you can say, yeah, but that's a piece of paper and you may have sneezed or something. But we can do this with machines that can measure this very exactly. <laughs> we can do it with titanium at a very thin level that virtually is, uh, you know, atomically. Two pieces that are atomically. You do it, and still the, uh, the crumples are different. And uh, John was telling me a lot about this. And he tells me, well, the reason that they it's different is that what you're looking at is the signature of time passing through, passing through the material. I love this concept. Um, the signature, because it's impossible in quantum mechanics to do the crumpling at exactly the same time. It, the sliver of time may be 10 to the minus 46 of a second different, but it's different. And so, the, uh, so what you've seen in the crumples is a kind of signature. Uh, and I, I, I kind of love that I, the idea, and I was working on it a lot in, in drawings and so on. I was, you know, so and, and those metal pieces, the metal piece with the light that goes through it, is actually based on that. Sainsbury, who, who was the uh, Lord Sainsbury, was the was the Minister of uh, Science. Science. Yeah, he visited CERN, and I was delegated to show him round part of it. So I was showing him round, and I, I was. He was looking at some of the work, and I, I explained the crumple theory, and he looked completely aghast at the whole thing. He said, "I will never, you know, throw away a crumple pe piece of paper again." 
<laughs> I always thought it was quite nice. I'll certainly never think of it in the same way again. Anyway, there we are. There's so, but that's as an artist, as a filmmaker. I think I'm trying to crumple the um, the process. You know, I think it is the key, Martin. The key is this: that the world. This is my experience, and I'm not telling you to follow in my footsteps or anything like that. But filmmaking is so formulaic. Artistic practice has become so formulaic. Literature is so formulaic. I mean, script writing courses tell you, oh, do it in a three-act structure. This is absurd. Do it in a three-act structure. Well, oh, Shakespeare didn't do it in a three-act structure. Do it in a three Or oh, all kinds of things. All kinds of theories about how these things should be done. And, um, uh, and my role, I think, is to defy that and to say that is just not the way it, it's to be done because of exactly what's in this film. When he, uh, John talks about skill and error, I thought that was beautiful, but by the way, when he was talking about that, that is something I profoundly believe, that you can have as much skill and consciousness uh, as, as you can ha have, but still the result will be different. And can you work with that, those changes, the inherent resistance, really, in the medium, is what I call it? Well, some of that came out of CERN, some of that kind of engagement with certain realities come came out of CERN. Um, and anyway, so there we go. It was, a, it was a fairly deep journey. As I always say, and I think I probably learned this from you work on working with other f filmmakers, is artists don't know what they're doing. And by that, no, I, by that I mean it's when you're making, true. it's not a form of knowledge. Yeah. It's not... A it's a discovery of knowledge in the for in the process of making, I, but you're abs I well, I agree. I don't think. I mean, it's very difficult, of course. If when I, if when I'm talking to, let's say, a producer about the next film, they want to know what the next film is. That's yeah. That's not what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> what, what I mean is, it's the art come that 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 thing that is art, isn't reducible to the conceptual. No, no that's very good. It's not. I don't, I don't think it. Is. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so we will agree on that. That's fine. That's lovely. Um, any, anyone with any thoughts, questions about physics, filmmaking? John Berger. Um, it was the first of its type um, on that level. Of course, there's been, after that, there's been a kind of vogue of um, science and art collaborations. Um, I, uh, w but they, they're not the same thing, though. Because this involved, as Martin's actually almost just said, I I a journey where we went to explore this. You didn't go to illustrate what was being done. When I set this up, first of all, I'd been very lucky. I'd, I'd made, you know, six or seven feature films at that time. And they were on, uh, quite often on release in France and, and in, in, in Switzerland. Uh, and I'd had a retrospective in Paris part of which then went to Geneva and a number of the uh, leading players in, um, in CERN saw the films and I was invited into CERN, I was just personally invited to go and have a look at the stuff and I wanted to do it. So I went and that was the beginning of the project because I said, I, you know, they said, you know, is there a f would you be interested in trying to make a film here? Uh, and the answer is yes, I would, but I didn't want to just walk around and, I mean, uh, and be a reporter. That that itself is interesting, but it's not really what I do. So what I w initially I proposed Copenhagen. You know the play Copenhagen. I even got the money. I got five million um, euros w as a budget from France for to do that, and the permission from CERN to shoot in their disused chambers. 
I, if you don't, if you know the play, it's a, it's a, the, it's the play is the, the discussion between the ghosts of Bohr and Heisenberg and um, Bohr's wife, and it's kind of rather fascinating. If it, and it deals with that uh, area of quantum mechanics. I, I was interested in doing with it, uh, dealing with it anyway, but um, it, oh, and my agent completely messed it up uh, somehow, and so uh, we couldn't acquire the rights. It was absurd, really, uh, because we had ha had the budget, and, and, and I think the BBC in the end did a version of it. But anyway, I was interested in doing something like that. Uh, but then. The idea of taking artists in, some of whom I knew very well, Patrick Hughes was an old friend of mine, I knew him very well, and Bartomil de Santos, I knew him well, uh, Richard Deacon I knew, but not very well, but I knew, and, and then the London Institute, as it was called at the time, maybe this was beneficial, now it's called the University of the Arts London. Um, the pro-rector there was a man who, who had a bit of vision, and uh, they asked me, they said, look, They'd asked me this. They said, well, you're a professor. Uh, why now, I've just been made a professor, wh why is the um, Institute's research rating so low with all these great artists there? And can you think of any, <laughs> can you think of something? In fact, uh, the, the, the rector himself has called me and he said, uh, I've got a job for you. I said, oh, what's that? He said, go away and come back in three weeks and tell me how we can get to a five-star <laughs> rating. <laughs> Ref, it was five stars in those days. It wasn't your three Go, go, go away, he had a very wry Scottish accent, go away, and in three weeks' time come back and tell me how we can make it. Well, that's a hell of a problem. However, I went off to CERN, and I, I taught, and I thought, well, this is extraordinary. We could actually uh, we, we, we could put our artists there, and students there, I thought, and we could develop something quite extraordinary. Well, it developed beyond that, because the Galleroids became interested, P Park, uh, which is the great uh, UK research council in, in particle physics and astronomy. Uh, they were very interested in this. And so uh, as that kind of finance came in, I didn't want to manage it. It would be too much uh, to try and be an artist and manage it and develop the, 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 the thing. So, um, so the management of the, of the project was taken by uh, Michael Benson, who I think did a great job of trying to ne negotiate some of these things. Because contractually now you're talking about, you know, it's like film contracts, of course. I'm talking about the actual exhibition and the motion. Uh, who owns the works when they're out? All this kind of stuff had to be dealt with. Fascinating stuff. Anyway, we did it and we did the project and we went in. But it was the first. And, and it, in many respects, uh, you know, I take my hat off to people trying to do these things. And I think they're difficult. But signatures of the invisible, my copyrighted title, by the way, I'm keeping so don't <laughs> I'm keeping that because I'm going to use it at some point. But signatures of the invisible was the first and was the biggest. And I mean, it's you know, its first opening was in London. The second was in Beijing. In Beijing, it won uh, the prize for outstanding work in art and science, which is an amazing award, really. And then it went from there to New York and then to. Gulbenkian, and then to Geneva, and then to uh, Rome, and um, I think it contributed to the university's five-star <laughs> rating. <laughs> they didn't increase my salary. No, Martin. It did change Michael Benson's life, because he gave up being a director of finance in the university, and is now an impresario, <laughs> an, art impres <laughs> an, an art impresario, marketing and he runs marketing and comms. Yeah, he was head of marketing and communications. He was a great guy to work with, actually. Uh, he, runs, but he, yeah, he now runs London Photography. Photo, Photo London. Photo London. No, he runs very big things. And actually, in a weird way, I suspect that CERN and that encounter might well have stimulated a lot of that. Yeah. Is that uh, some sort of answer to the question? Were all, uh, another side of that is, were all the artists as, you know, uh, determined? And uh, I would, you'd have to say it was variable. That doesn't mean that they're not, not brilliant artists, but it was variable in so far as, I mean, what an opportunity to sit with, you know, the guy who invented the internet, we sat with him for, because the internet had really exploded just about then. Uh, Banners, what's his name? Yeah, uh, he was there, I had lunch with him r at that time quite a bit. And that's absolutely fascinating to talk about uh, how that came about, why it came about, 
what the expectations were of that. Um, so I was surprised that s that the offer, uh, by the way, I, you were always given accommodation there. The accommodation, we used to call it, um, <laughs> uh, um, what we call it? Anyway, it was, it was it, it, let me say it was sparse, okay. but it was on site, which is wonderful. So maybe that put people off staying there for any length of time. But um, I was there, I mean, I was fortunate enough to be there when, the, when they finally found the Higgs. I was in the control room when the Higgs was the first signals came up. You know, they'd been searching for the Higgs boson for a long time. The, the, the God particle, as it was called, the thing th that allows matter to exist. And I, I happened to be there um, in that period and lo and behold, uh, they, they got it. And then I was invited to go to the, the, the moment when um, Higgs himself came over. Higgs was a Scottish physicist. He came up with this theory in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and it was only proven a few years ago. So, uh, what a, what a, crikey, you only live once, you may as well, <laughs> may as well take some of this in, really. There we are, I hope that's got some. So I was very enthusiastic, I suppose that's another side of it. Perhaps crazily so. Peter Higgs was, he was at Edinburgh University. Yes. And when he was at Edinburgh University, he was the branch chair of the union of the UCU. Was he really? Yeah. That's not really bad. A man of many talents. Ma yeah. um, any other thoughts on science, art? No. Oh, you can, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a good question that. Um, I, I mean, it's one of those weird things. Maths and physics, I was okay at in school. I wasn't a great pupil, but I was okay at that. And art. So in other words, anything slightly abstract, I was quite good at. Anything more concrete, I, I was not particularly good at. Um, and then, for various reasons, I won't go through the whole details, but I, I, I worked for a couple of years, and then I went to art school, and I went, went to Liverpool College of Art here in Hope Street. Uh, I, a revelation. Right. Apart from loving the city as well, which I came to, to, came to love at that time, and so on, uh, I, I, and the experience there. There were a number of remarkable teachers there. One was called Heinz Koppel. Heinz Koppel was a German... A refugee because he, he, he arrived here in the late 30s, I think, and had been very closely aligned to Schwitters, the, the, and they ex ex had exhibited together. And another, th uh, the great photographer, montagist, uh, Johnny Hartfelt. So these names may, may mean something, but they came out of German art of the, of the 20s and 30s, and they, they'd obviously got out uh, during the Nazi period. But um, Heinz was a great teacher. Uh, not just about painting, but forcing conceptual comprehension of what you were doing, trying to force, not, uh, in, not, not in a stupid way, but like, I'll give you an example. I arrive in, in uh, Myrtle Street is actually where the annex was when I was painting, the, the first year. I arrive there and uh, this, this chap's there and he tells us we're all conditioned, we're, all, we're, we're thoroughly conditioned, and how can we break with the conditioning that we are carrying with us and move towards a, a, a more creative position? Is it possible? Um, I hadn't even thought of it. So there I was. And then the next thing was, you put up a canvas. I, I went and bought a canvas, sput it up, and I painted it white. Um, I just with emulsion paint. I was going to start working on it, but I painted the canvas white. And Heinz came around and he sat there looking at this, me, me painting it white. I became a bit embarrassed because it took a half an hour or so and he just watched me paint it white. And afterwards uh, he said, why have you painted it white? And I said, well, it's, it's just the undercoat. You know? And then he <laughs> looked at me and he said, uh, don't you think the undercoat could be as important as the overcoat? Okay. Well, of course, in painting it is. Are you going to consider? But that was, the, that was the first afternoon, I think of my experience at Liverpool College of Art. After that, 
the issue of what is a canvas, what is structure, what is space, what were very prominent in our discussions. And they had been in art, of course, in the 20s and, and in the Russian constructivists and many other people that had taken these kind of things on. So, I, so there was, a, there was a, a sort of a fusion there. Uh, not, not getting rid of spontaneity and, not and things like that, and but, uh, but it was there. So there was interest. Um, and uh, the more I moved away from figurative painting, the more important uh, conceptual lines of thought were. I never moved away completely from figurative painting, actually, but uh, nevertheless, that's uh, so that's how that, that came about. And actually, the move to cinema and <coughs> to filmmaking so was was a continuation of that line because uh, I became very concerned about what the, what is the time is there a time element in painting there is in a novel we know that you start and, and you go to it and so on uh, what is, does a does a painting step outside time to the master uh, this kind of thing <laughs> just questions really not I don't have answers of course there is a time element as far as the eye goes the eye chooses to move between sp spot and spot. But, um, well, those things, that kind of consideration moved me. I mean, I was lucky, but I left Liverpool in uh, 1970 and, w and uh, got into the Slade. So I, that was just a piece of luck, really. Um, and I got into the Slade to do postgraduate painting, but they had also a history of cinema course running parallel, one the likes of which we will never have in this country again, I don't think. And it, it, it was, as I say, good fortune or chance. It was run by a man called Thorold Dickinson. And Dickinson had managed to collect uh, a massive amount of uh, original prints from uh, world cinema, uh, many of them on silver nitrate. And the University College in London had a, a viewing theatre, smaller than this, but it was a viewing theatre which had the, the certificate to show silver nitrate prints, which I don't know if you know what... what the, what the silver nitrate, it can be self-combustible, so it can just explode. And you've got to have the absolutely right viewing facilities, etc. It's a chemical base. But there's never been film stock as good, and there's never been that kind of photography as good as shot on the silver nitrate stocks. And so when I was at the Slade, uh, along came people, well, they they were we, we were given, let's say, one term, three nights a week, you saw French cinema. Well, three nights a week adds up to 30 films in a term. And the 30 films projected, some of them on silver nitrate, some of them going back, films you could never see in many respects, except Renoir and so on. Um, well, by the time that term's over, you know quite a lot about French cinema. And the next term was Italian cinema. The next term was Russian cinema. The next was Japanese cinema. Now, why he had all these prints was because he'd been significant in British war propaganda. And he had, uh, you know, he, he, he made a number of great films, actually. I mean, they're propaganda films. They're really still good films. What, uh, Careless Talk Costs Lives is one. You may have heard of it. Yeah, it's a great film. Um, he'd made that after the war. Uh, he had spoken out in the defence of people like um, Ozu in Japan, and things like who had been whipped up in the propaganda machines of these different countries. Uh, Rossellini, who made films for the Italian uh, Mussolini period, and uh, he had he'd been given prints of a lot of their films, just things like and, and they went to the Slade. As far as I understand, I think they're in the National Film Archive now. Because the Slade got rid of it, it's probably too expensive to run. But that's how they did it. Ren people like Renoir came to the Slade. I, Renoir came to see my first film, and he asked me the same question. Actually, no, I'd had, I made a film, and Coldstream, who was head of the Slade, was a painter, but also a film editor. He'd been Grierson's editor in the 1930s. He fought in the Spanish Civil War, and I was very left wing. And he said to me that one day I will, if, if I'm still as left wing <laughs> when I'm his age, he'd get very worried about me. <laughs> However, he's long gone. But anyway, it's just an interesting discussion. But Coldstream, uh, 
said to me, he saw the first film that I made at the stage, and he said, that is not a film. I said, it's not a film, that's an essay. Right? It's just, it, it, Ken, this is not a film. <laughs> well, I don't know, if, well, you can choose whether you want to call it. So I, I was very worried about that. But it so ha coincided with Renoir himself visiting us and giving us a talk about film. And um, Colston said to Renoir, yes, he's made a film, it's an essay, it's not a film. And Renoir said, oh, I want to see the essay, can I see it? Um, so he came to see it. And then Renoir said, this is a film. <laughs> I hated the film, he said. And he said, if it could be projected and it draws in your attention like this, it is a film. So it was very abstract, that. Coldstream went on to write a very significant report, a yeah. government report, which is called the Coldstream Report. Yeah. And it was about uh, art education and the move from art education as a technical uh, and vocational training to an art school and later university university subject. Mm. And the 1968 sit-ins in mm. the Hornsey and Guildford mm. art schools were in reaction to and Liverpool. In Liverpool, mm. of which Ken was famous a part. Um, <laughs> was were in reaction to the publication of the, the Coldstream report. Yeah, yeah I, I think I got into the slate, partly because I demonstrated against Coldstream so, uh, so vividly. He was a man with a broad sense, and so he was kind of intrigued, I think, who this character was. Very good. Well, Roy, you know that stuff, yeah. 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 I went to the school last year. Pardon? I went to the school last year. Did you? When when were you there? Oh, two times. Yeah, okay, no good. Well Hartfield Kane. Yes, I know, yeah. You do know that, yeah. Well, I think it's well, I think the guy started there. He went into a thing the school I came from, didn't he? But excellent. Uh, yeah, yeah. He was he was brought there by Heinz Koppel. Yeah. And uh, I and I knew I didn't know he was fifth. I knew he was very high up on the wanted list because of those montages he'd done. In and they were incredibly powerful, of course. They were very powerful. Uh, well, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, concept, that isn't it? Really? And John comes back with religious art uh, having its great power at certain times and all the rest of it. Uh, um, yeah, Stalin's favorite artist. Pardon? Stalin's favourite artist, <laughs> Hartfield. Well, Stalin, called, Stalin apparently called uh, Johnny Hartfelt uh, in order to say the father of communist art. He said that only once. Yeah. Yeah, when, when Hartfield big did a montage. But I think the other montages he didn't like very much. <laughs> so it was a good job that Hartfield wasn't there. <laughs> anyway, he did come to Liverpool. There's a story. There's a film. Hartfield. Johnny Hartfield came to, came to Liverpool College of Art, and it was wonderful, really. He came, his wife was his translator. And my memory of it, it's maybe distorted, but I think it's probably fairly accurate. His wife was considerably taller than him, and she was translating. And when she was translating, they were just arguing all the time. <laughs> so really shouting at each other. <laughs> I, I suppose he was saying, I didn't say that, I said this. And it was, it was an amazing event, anyway. Great. Did you go to Hope Street? Uh, oh, did you? Myrtle Street, yeah, great. Great. Well, you prob probably followed that same route then. I, I loved it anyway when I was there. It's all right. yeah. Sorry, I have memory of that. Oh, let's, let's, let's wind, wind this up. Any, oth any, other, any other thoughts, questions? You've all been very patient. You have. Thank you. Given given the snow outside as well. Um, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank Ken for projecting his film uh, and uh, for his great insights uh, on art uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much, Ken. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for your <laughs> attention and so on. Uh, for bearing with it. Mm.